So I wasn't sure whether a 2000 subscriber milestone was big enough to celebrate with an entire video. But after asking around and also hitting 10,000 subscribers on Tumblr for whatever reason, I thought it would be nice to do something at least. I know the popular thing to go for with a milestone video is to do a Q&A, but since my audience is still pretty small, I didn't want to rely on subscribers for content. I looked around for what other sort of milestone videos one can do and one suggestion was to do a room tour. Now the thing is, I don't have the most exciting room in the world and apart from being always messy, there's not much to show. But what I do have in my room are my bookshelves. So I figured why not give a small tour of my shelves and give a few books shout outs. Maybe you'll see something you'd want to look into yourself or maybe you're just curious what sort of things I either read or at least care enough about to spend money on a book with the delusions of grandeur that I'll actually have the executive dysfunction to sit down and read it. So here we are. The first shelf is literally just the Yusagi Yojimbo shelf. Yusagi Yojimbo is an American comic by artist and writer Stan Sakai. It's roughly inspired by the history of real-world swordsman and philosopher Musashi Yamamoto, who is the main subject in the manga Vagabond by Takehiko Inoue, if you're familiar with that. Yusagi Yojimbo is in part about Japanese real-world history, real-world Japanese politics of the time, translated onto fictional characters and political figures, and part Japanese folklore and mostly a drama and or comedy depending on the story's situation. Yusagi Yojimbo is probably tied for my favorite American comic and is incredibly important to me. It recently switched publishers for a second time going from Dark Horse to IDW, but I've sadly not been able to keep my collection up to date for various reasons. I'll fix that eventually. I have a few doubles, mostly due to hardcovers and softcovers being a little different and also just based on whether Sakai has signed them or not. I also have Space Yusagi, which I was lucky to find, but I believe is a little hard to come by these days, as well as the art book and several of Stan Sakai's sketchbooks, which he sells at conventions. I also have Stan Sakai's retelling of the 47 Ronin, which is a historical event that might as well be folklore at this point. And I have a few of the regular comic books of both Yusagi Yojimbo and the 47 Ronin. Yusagi also frequently pops up in the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle comic stories and vice versa as Stan and Kevin Eastman are longtime friends. Next is the basic manga shelf. I actually don't have as much manga as you'd expect, mostly because I find trying to buy takubons of an entire story and actually find every single issue is really difficult. So I always end up having gaps unless the series is very short. And even then, I still end up missing volumes sometimes. I don't have volume 5 of Revolutionary Girl Utina, for instance. And for Lone Wolf and Cub, I do fine and then I jump from issue 7 to issue 21. I think the only complete Takubon collection I have aside from Sailor Moon is The Girl from the Other Side, which I actually keep on a separate shelf. You won't see it on the big book shelf. And that is a manga series that I bought as it was coming out and cared enough to really seek out and make sure I have every single volume of it. It's by an author named Nagabe and I highly, highly recommend it. I cannot recommend it enough. I believe it has an OVA or a movie coming out soon. I'm a little nervous just because of how unique the art style is, but the trailer makes it look like they at least kind of know what they're doing and they're not transplanting it to look like a more traditional modern anime in terms of art design. I have a handful of the Roroni Kenshin omnibuses and I very almost got rid of them apart from number two, which was a gift, but I changed my mind eventually just because I like the art so much. It's a shame the artist and writer turned out to be a horrible person, but sometimes all you can do is just be aware of that so you don't heap praises upon the creator and instead focus on the art and what you can learn from it or how it speaks to you personally. YMS once said of Roman Polanski that art is too important to worry about the temporary artist, but he also added he wouldn't go watch a new Polanski movie in theaters while the man is still alive at least. In the same way that a pandering Oscar film that, that touches on legitimate social issues that I agree with isn't necessarily a good movie. They're separate conversations. 
Mm -hmm. You can have the you can be the most perfect person with the best intent, the best intentions, and be talking about serious social issues that deserve to be talked about right now, and still make a shit movie. In the same way that you can be <laughs> yeah. an actual fucking <laughs> and make really great movies. <laughs> right? Yeah, he's a sick person. He deserves to die, hopefully soon. Rot in hell. <laughs> I think like most things, it's something you have to judge on a case-by-case -case basis. Nobuhiro Watsuki is not going to make any money from me just enjoying the art of books I already own. That being said, I don't think I'd buy any more of them. But I will continue to enjoy Kenshin media like the live action movies and anime, which are only based on his manga and don't have any direct involvement by him. Too many artists work to bring these stories to life to all be thrown under the bus just for his transgressions. It'd be like boycotting Daniel Radcliffe because he was in the Harry Potter movies when he was 11 years old. Moving on because I'm rambling. Next is the Osamu Tezuka shelf. I have the two Astro Boy manga I own on the general manga shelf because they don't actually fit here in terms of space. But these are all the Tezuka mangas I own. I've read all of them except the second part of Message to Adolf. I read the first part, but as you'd imagine, the subject matter is really upsetting, so I put it aside for now. I'll probably have to reread part 1 before starting part 2, however. My favorite manga by him is definitely Apollo's Song, which combines a lot of Tezuka's favorite genres into one story, like Greek myth, history, and sci-fi. I only learned afterwards this is considered one of his more somber stories, as it came from the civil unrest of Japanese students in the 1970s. It's not nearly as dark as MV though, but MV is so dark it feels like reading a 1970s Japanese um, pink movie more than anything else. Which is perfectly fine, but I was very aware of the genre when I read it, whereas Apollo's song is just Apollo's song, if that makes sense. Next is the most obvious shelf I have, the Sailor Moon shelf. Not much to say, uh, it is what it is. I own all of the Sailor Moon and Sailor V in English in the 2003 reprints of the manga, and I own most of the manga in Japanese apart from Volume 1, Volume 12, the second Sailor V manga, and the short stories. These are mostly also the 2003 reprints except for the Sailor V which is a first edition. Also various Sailor Moon tat, including the only Funko Pop still allowed on my shelf. I have more but they're in storage. I don't have as much, thankfully. But um, this is the only one that I would actually put on my shelf, except for maybe Garrus. I think, I think Garrus Vicarian would still be allowed on my shelf. But at the moment, Sailor Moon is the only one you'll see. I also have these activity books I bought when I was 14 and my family went to Germany. I also have a German book that has all the lyrics of the songs, which was a prized item when I was 14. I have it stashed somewhere for safekeeping, I, I'm not sure where it is, um, I still need to scan the whole thing, I've put it somewhere where it can't get damaged, so you won't just see it on the shelf. I don't think I'd buy the Sailor Moon manga again if it's just a re-release or like in an omnibus form, but I am interested in possibly one day buying the coloured versions which came out recently where the entire manga have been coloured, not just the first few pages of each Takobon. Although I don't really know where I'd put them if I got them. Um, I am already short on space so I might have to... Excuse me, madam. I am filming. Do not poo on my bed. Hmm? Are you hungry? Okay, hold on everyone. Next is what was going to be the Shigeru Mizuki shelf, but I ended up having to put some manga that have nothing to do with him here as well, just because of space. So this is like the, I don't know, a higher reading manga. I, I don't know. I've thought about making a video on Shigeru Mizuki because he's one of my favorite manga authors. I have all the volumes of Showa, which I adore so far. I've only read the first volume, mostly because when I started reading it, it was a little too much like real life at the moment, so I needed to give it a break. I think it might be worth going back to maybe in the next month or so, 
but considering the whole global atmosphere at the moment, I might have to think about it closely before I decide to just jump back in. But then again, will there ever be a good period to read something like this? I think there's always going to be something going on in the world to relate to it a little too closely. Unless I wait like 200 years, but even then, it's, it's just going to relate to real life in some form or another. I also have his manga based on his own childhood growing up in rural Japan, mixed with his greatest love, which is Japanese yokai and folklore. He's a fascinating person, I really need to do that video at some point. I also have some of Junko Mizuno's work. I'm probably in the minority here where I prefer her work from like her mid period, around the time she was drawing pure trance. Her current work is a lot more advanced and intricate and much more fine art gallery, but I enjoy her work most where it was some way past her influences from 80s toys and Sailor Moon, but just starting to get intricate and psychedelic. Next is one of the Terry Pratchett shelves. Not much to say here either. I've actually not read all of these just yet, mostly because ever since high school, sitting down and reading is a lot harder with other easier methods to occupy myself, whereas in school all you really had was reading, which is a little upsetting. I do have my three favorite Terry Pratchett books in hardcover, which is Reaper Man, which is about the Grim Reaper having an existential crisis, The Truth, which is about the birth of the newspaper industry and wizards protesting movable type as unlawful magic and Night Watch which is considered one of his best work. It's basically Les Mis with time travel and Clint Eastwood as the main character. I also have these two maps but this one's glue disintegrated when I opened it so I'll only show you it as I'm scared to open the other one now until I figure out how to re-glue these without damaging them. There's also this which is like paper craft for masochists. I bought it with the lofty idea that I'll somehow scan every single page and build this thing without destroying the book, but I think I need to accept it's just going to remain an interesting book on my shelf. There's also the script book from the Hogfather TV special, which I also have on DVD. The Paul Kidby art book, which I really love. I prefer Kidby's art for Discworld more than Jack Kirby personally. Jack Kirby's art is very 70s Dungeons and Dragons, but I feel Kid B's Discworld art is unique to Discworld. I also have the hardcover for The Lost Hero, which I'm annoyed about because a little bit after this one they released the paperback version and it has more art than the hardcover. So I'm kind of angry about that, but only a little bit. Next is the Western comic shelf. A good chunk of this shelf is like only Disney Duck comics, which I didn't really think about until after I started filming this, like how many of these I have. I have a few of the collections of the original Carl Barks comics, one or two of which I haven't read yet, but by far my absolute favorite of the Duck comics as a whole is the legendary Life and Times of Scrooge McDuck by Don Rosa. It's based on Carl Barks' original notes and scraps and pieces of Barks' stories of Scrooge's life and Don Rosa put together the pieces and how um, Scrooge McDuck became Scrooge McDuck. Don Rosa kind of just rearranged it into a proper timeline and then wrote a story around it. The comic starts in the year 1877 in Glasgow and ends in the year 1947 in Duffburg, America. It follows Scrooge from poor shoeshine boy of an impoverished family, how he travels to America at age 13 working as a cabin boy, and how he continuously tries and fails and tries and fails to make his fortune through America and Australia and even South Africa at one point. From the Mississippi steamboats, to the gold rush in the American West, to the Yukon in Canada, as well as returning briefly to Scotland and like I said traveling to South Africa and Australia. A big focus of the comic is how Scrooge in his youth chases after wealth in the form of gold and diamonds and jewels and things and various other physical riches and at the end despite being the richest duck in the world as far as money goes his true wealth lies in every experience he's had and all his failures, hardships and disappointments to get where he is. Which is why the number one dime is so important. It's a reminder of where he started and a foundation to his memories and experiences. It's a really phenomenal book, like I cannot heap praises on this story enough. It also has its own original soundtrack, composed by Thomas Holopainen, 
who is the keyboardist and composer of the band Nightwish, who you might be familiar with. The Life and Times of Scrooge McDuck is his first solo album and each track is meant to accompany a specific chapter in the book. This is where I begin my story. Rana Moor, 1877, the eve of my 10th birthday. All of them are instrumental except for the single called A Lifetime of Adventure. I feel they need to mention that the vocals on the single is by Thomas's wife Johanna and not Fleur Janssen, as this is not a Nightwish album. Just so that you don't go thinking, oh there's a Fleur Janssen album I haven't heard and then she's not on the album. <laughs> I'm sad this album came out after I had read the book because I cannot imagine reading it while listening to the accompanying music. I might have lost my mind. I only met Don Rosa once when I was at San Diego Comic Con and I think I was so excited to see him there at all because he tends to go to Europe more than America. He was a little bit standoffish with me, probably because I was being like the most cringe ever just because I was so excited. He was very nice to me, he was just a little bit, who are you and why do you have my comics when they're not licensed to sell in South Africa. But honestly, Disney has fucked him over his entire career, so I'm not even gonna hold that against him. Reminder that Disney is a fake Duck Comics fan. You belong to Disney! Which means you stay busy! Cranking out magic and assembly line whimsy! Anyway, we need to move on because I can talk Duck Comics all day. Maybe that's another video worth making at some point. I also have a few random comics like the graphic novel of The Last Unicorn, which is based on the book, not the movie. The first volume of Rickety Stitch, which I'm embarrassed I still need to get to, but I am obsessed with the art. I have a hardcover version of Mouse, which is a very difficult comic to read, but I recommend it to literally everyone at least once. I believe there was some drama in the US, as it was actually on the school reading list, but was removed and replaced by the fictional story The Boy in the Striped Pajamas, which was considered more age appropriate. You know, because our children should only know about the family-friendly version of the Nazi genocide. So they need to read the fictionalized story from the perspective of a non-Jewish boy who feels sad about it, rather than a first-hand account from a Jewish family who were not only in the concentration camps and managed to live through it, but also the generational trauma inherited in living through these events. No, no, no. No, read the book about the non-Jewish boy being sad about his friend. D don't worry about the true story, look over here instead. Ugh. We're not supposed to be friends, you and me. We're meant to be enemies. Hmm, I don't know. I think we should be enemies. I also have Fun Home by Alison Bechdahl, which I only read recently and is another comic that's difficult to read but I recommend it to almost everyone. It's not as hard to stomach as Mouse, but also deals with very heavy topics. Specifically growing up with a father who was a broken person due to gay repression and suppression, untreated bipolar disorder and um, committing suicide at a relatively young age and the generational trauma tied to that upbringing while also navigating life as a lesbian in the 1960s and 70s America. Also, I did start reading Are You My Mother, but I had to stop eventually. Um, I don't think I'm ready for that book yet, so I've read Fun Home. I haven't read the other one yet. I am aware of it and it's very good, but I'm not, I'm not there yet. And then there is Seconds by the same author of Scott Pilgrim, but I don't think I'm a big fan of it. It's an extremely simplistic story stretched to an agonizing length of pages, following a rather unlikable main character. It also has the added problem that Scott Pilgrim has a very distinctive art style to it, whereas Seconds has been boiled down to the most generic Cal Artsian style imaginable, making it visually indistinguishable from a lot of modern comics. I also have some sketchbooks from Chris Sanders and the complete Scott Pilgrim, although I think I prefer the movie in this case. I also have various volumes of Pogo comics on a few shelves. Uh, you'll see more Pogo books here and there. 
Pogo is an American comic from the 40s until the 70s by Walt Kelly and was a major inspiration to the comic book Bone by Jeff Smith. Kelly was an animator at Disney from 1935 until he left in 1941 after the Disney animators strike for unionization. Artists begging me to stop! I won't let them! Labor conditions in my show! I don't sweat them! I've read some regard Walt Kelly as the unofficial 10th member of the Disney Nine Old Men, although ironically he is best known for everything he did after he left Disney. I was extremely lucky one day when I found a huge stack of these at a secondhand bookshop and I just bought all of them. I find them tricky to read just because of the very heavy dialect it's written in as I'm not American, but I still really really like them. The art is absolutely incredible. After that we have the TMNT shelf. I haven't read all of these as a good chunk of them were a gift that I was given all at the same time, but ironically one of the ones I have read are the thickest book on this shelf. I also have some art book of Eastman's original work on the very first incarnation of the Turtle comics in the 80s when it started out as a parody of Frank Miller's writing style before evolving into its own bizarre entity and outliving Frank Miller's relevancy, which I think is probably one of the only times I can think of that happening, where the parody of someone's work outlives the thing that it's supposed to be parodying. Well maybe Airplane? Kind of? Maybe. I'm not sure. Ninja Turtles kind of is its own thing now, like I don't even know if most people are even aware of the fact that it's supposed to be a parody. It takes nearly a minute to fall from this height, and despite what you may have heard, you're likely to stay conscious all the way down. Thoughts like that keep me warm at night. Already the pudgy ones are starting to panic. Raph loves this stuff. He's not alone. Why is he narrating? Is he crazy? Next is the placeholder shelf, I guess, where I put some paperbacks that didn't really have anywhere else to go. A good few Agatha Christie novels, including my favorite Miss Marple story, The Moving Finger, which I do recommend. Just don't watch the BBC adaptation of this specific book, because of course, despite it being a very good series, the BBC decided to completely ruin my favorite in the Miss Marple series. All the others are good, except my favorite, because of course. I also have Stephen King's On Writing, which is half a book focused on his philosophy regarding writing as a whole, and half autobiography. This is ironically the only Stephen King book I've read. I actually recommend the audiobook of this, as it's read by Stephen King himself, and it's really fascinating. And Stephen King's way of narrating is really captivating, so it's very interesting hearing him read his own words. I think that's the version on Audible. Um, if not, try and find the one where Stephen King is the person reading the book. It's, it's very, very, very good. I also have this book I still need to get to, covering the entire history of the Russian ballet. I'm one of those people where I will have zero interest in the subject, but I will devour endless documentaries and books about it. We then go to the second American comic shelf, this time with less ducks. Apart from the IDW My Little Pony graphic novels and the sporadic Hellboy volumes, I have the complete collection of the original Sam and Max comic, which I bought off the author at Comic-Con, who was sitting at his booth playing a ukulele. And when I walked past him and got excited about the Sam and Max comic, he was like, oh, do you know these characters? And I was like, oh, hell yeah. To which he responded, oh, hell yeah, yeah, I like that. Before he looked like really stoic and he was like, oh, but please, please. No swearing at Comic-Con. It, it was about as amazing as it sounds. I also have the first issue of the Adventure Zone comics, which is very good. It's not a direct one-to-one -one adaptation, but I think that actually works in its favor because you're not just reading the transcript of the original podcast. And then I have the first volume of Cucumber Quest, which is probably my favorite webcomic of all time. And some of the most incredible color work I've ever seen in a comic. Unfortunately, after like 10 years of work, the artist has had to switch to an illustrated story format instead of comic, because if she had any hope of finishing the story in her lifetime, that became a necessity. It makes me sad, but I also fully understand. I still want to get the other printed volumes one day. I think she's printed them up until volume 5. I have a good collection of Empowered by Adam Warren, which are great, and the first volume of Lackadaisy Cats, 
And then I have one of Musa's collected sketchbooks and they were selling them through Gumroad. And I had it ring bound just because I love their work so much. Next shelf I could spend the entire video on so I'm going to have to really reduce how much time I spend here is art books. First is my collection on the art of sci-fi ranging from the original magazine covers of pulp sci-fi from the books of the 1930s all the way to the Xbox 360 and PS3 which was the latest release at the time of the books um, publish, publishment <laughs> is that a word? It's uh, not on the shelf right now because I need to look up what glue to use to reattach the spine which has come loose unfortunately. We have a massive Walt Disney tome, The Monster Book of Monsters by John Landis who's kind of a prat but the book is very good. And more sci-fi and Disney focused books and then I have the Porco Rosso and Totoro art books. But the most interesting of the three Ghibli books I have is the one on the Tales of Earthsea. I don't like the Tales of Earthsea Ghibli movie, which I know is not exactly like a controversial opinion. But as mediocre as the movie is, it did get me to start reading Ursula Le Guin. And it spawned this art book, which weirdly is probably the best Ghibli art book I've seen. It's got endless production notes and rough model sheets, and not only Ozu's background paintings, but also the watercolor plannings for the background paintings. I also have this biography on H.P. Lovecraft and I cannot recommend this enough. I bought this brand new for $10 at Comic Con and this biography is so comprehensive and also completely full color. It also is careful not to excuse Lovecraft's more problematic opinions on certain subjects like his xenophobia and his racism but also it doesn't downplay his Munchausen by proxy relationship with his mother and his lifelong suicidal ideation. It paints a very detailed picture of who he was as well as his influences to his writing from Edgar Allan Poe to Greek and Roman mythology and the influence of his family history with his own men mental illness and quote unquote madness. It doesn't ignore the racism and such but it paints it in context which I really like. It doesn't excuse it and it doesn't overplay it, it just presents it as fact. There's also some Brian Froud books, I need to get a new book of fairies as mine is falling apart, art books for Persona 3 and Persona 4, and the art book for Okami which is fantastic. It's meant to look like a traditionally bound Japanese book and in some areas trying to replicate the look of a scroll. It has very detailed notes on each character design and like the thought process behind it, it's, it's very good. I have a couple of books from James Gurney who did the Dinotopia books and he's on YouTube actually by the way. A Masters of Animation book which I actually have two copies of as my mom and dad both bought me the same book. This My Little Pony picture book which is drawn in a much more traditional children's book style which I really like. The art book for Kingdom Hearts which isn't actually that great to be honest, the print quality isn't the best and it's rather thin. And then I have this amazing Disney book I bought while I was in Australia for um, holiday ones. It's not only got information on the Disney company's films across their history but even has replicas of things like original Disneyland tickets and a replica of a Cinderella cell, matinee brochures and movie premieres etc. It's really really good and gives a much more tactile look at the studio's history rather than just recounting information. Then I have the art book for Secret of Kells and the Dorfus movie as well as a rather interesting book which specifically focuses on animation during the late 60s and 70s when it was published. It covers this animation period in much deeper detail than any other animation book I have have or have read covering the media as a whole. It goes like really really in depth into just this time period. And the final shelf of the big bookcase is the one I still have a lot of room on, the French comic shelf. This one kind of just became a necessity after I realized how many French comics I've managed to accumulate, which is impressive considering how hard it is to find French comics here that aren't Asterix or Tintin. I also managed to find a single issue of Le Fou, which I can't read but has some really great 70s French sci-fi visuals, which is like a very very specific aesthetic. Then I have some of the Asterix books I own but not all of them. The Tintin Companion which is essentially a history book on the comic and Hergé himself and also like the European climate 
worked while he was publishing because the original Tintins were written and published actually before, during and after World War II and Belgium's occupation during that time, which affected Hergé's writing to a very obvious degree in what he could and could not say during that um, period. The Tintin books you see here on the shelf are from my dad's original collection of all the volumes from when he was a child. I just have these two here because I think I was rereading them the most recently. I, I should have Tintin in Tibet on the shelf because it's my favorite, but I it must be downstairs. I also have a few Spiro albums, the second album for Valerian and Laureline because it's the issue that Star Wars took a lot of inspiration from, a good few Black Sad volumes, and then I have The Inkal. The Inkal is a joint comic book made by Alejandro Khodorowsky and the artist Mobius. When Khodorowsky's Dune wasn't able to get made, Khodorowsky and Mobius worked together to create the Inkal comic, using several ideas they were going to have in the Dune movie and then they used it here and in some cases some of the exact storyboards were repurposed for the comic. When I read it at first, I didn't think I liked it, but it's one of those things where I finished it and I was just kind of mildly entertained by the ending, and then I couldn't stop thinking about it for like the next five years. And with that, we have done all of the largest bookshelf. Moving to the smaller one, the top shelf is the sci-fi and fantasy novel section. Many of these I've read, but a good chunk of them I haven't. The first Wheel of Time book actually belongs to my brother. He's just letting me borrow it until I one day manage to actually read it. I did start and I do like it so far. I just need to keep going with it. I also have Peter Beagle's The Last Unicorn as well as a not unpublished novel, but a novel he had published back in the 80s. And then it's set in a warehouse for like 30 years, if I remember the story correctly and there was some or other problem with getting it released and then it never got to shelves and then when I went to Comic Con that year he was selling them off or something. I'm not entirely sure what the story is. I still need to read this one but incidentally I hear he's finally managed to get the rights of The Last Unicorn back again which is really really good. I'm so happy to hear that because he's another one of those authors that has been sadly severely screwed regarding copyright of his own work. Next we have the Bone Shelf. Bone is a singular comic story by Jeff Smith and is the comic tied with Yusagi Yojimbo for my favorite comic of all time. Unlike Yusagi, which is an ongoing collection of short stories, Bone is one large singular story with a beginning, middle and end. I bought it on a whim a few months before I graduated high school and I was forbidden from reading it until after my exams. Since then, I've bought a second copy because I was worried about my original copy's condition. I was scared it would just start falling apart. As well as the colored version, which for a long time was considered too thick to be turned into a colored book just due to the extra weight the ink would put on what the fans of the comic refer to as the brick. However, it was recently released as a colored version in hardback. I'm actually not even sure if they managed to release it um, as a paperback at all. I think the pages would not be able to, I don't know, how, what are the technical terms? Like, you can't really put a book this large in color in paperback form because it would just fall apart quite literally. I also have it in individual trade paperbacks, although sadly I lent a friend the first three volumes and never saw them again and have since broken off that friendship. Despite owning the story four times over, I would probably like to buy it a fifth time if I can find a hardcover of the original black and white version. I actually prefer the comic in black and white um, compared to color, not because the color is bad, I just I prefer the black and white. I also have the art book and when I spent an embarrassing amount of money at Smith's booth at Comic Con one year, his wife Vijaya was incredibly kind and gifted me these three little figures here. I also have this figure over here on the other bookshelf and a metallic lunchbox up here. I also have a print I want to get framed which is somewhere and a plush although it's not out at the moment. I adore this comic more than I can possibly say and I urge everyone to read it if you can find it. I heard Jeff Smith's deal with Netflix for an animated adaptation fell through recently which I'm disappointed in because I know having the story in animated form has been a goal of his for literally decades by this point. However, I can't say I'm sad for myself because to me it's so perfect in comic form. 
and I worry how trying to adapt it into an animation movie or TV series might have the producers think the story is meant squarely for children and force Jeff Smith to really scale down some of the violent and scary imagery in the story, which would really harm it, I think. Then we have another favorite shelf of mine, which is the movie shelf. Any book I have on the movie industry goes here. Also, uh, this is on the wrong shelf. <clears throat> I have a good few biographies and autobiographies, which is a favorite genre of mine, especially autobiographies. I've got Jen Cleese and Shirley Temple, Jackie Chan, David Niven, and then I have a whole bunch of books on The Goon Show, which was a radio show, not a film, but it definitely belongs here on the film shelf. If you've never listened to The Goon Show, I recommend it. One of the players is actually Peter Sellers, so that should give you an idea of the style of comedy. Uh, Peter, uh, what, what is this? It was to have been, my dear Kermit, it was to have been a grand impersonation of Her Late Majesty Queen Victoria, <laughs> whilst on vacation at Bognor Regis, in the year 1888. But, but uh, what went wrong? I couldn't remember what she looked like. Oh. It's basically a proto Monty Python, especially since one of the goons was Spike Milligan himself. A lot of the goon show is actually hosted on YouTube and I've seen it advertised on Audible and it's also on Spotify. And if you like Monty Python or the movie Airplane, I highly recommend it. You might say he disappeared from under her very nose. What is he doing there? It was raining, I believe. <laughs> Lady Marx. Where is her ladyship at the moment? My lady hasn't got a ship at the moment. <laughs> I don't wish to know that. Hey, don't wish to know that. Then I have some books on film in general. The book on silent film is incredible. I used a lot of information from here in the 1930s cartoon video. The book on Japanese film I still need to finish completely but it's really fascinating. Only two pages I think is devoted to anime and there's only one chapter devoted to kaiju and the rest of it is all of Japan's rich live action film which has a tendency to go underappreciated in English speaking countries. I also have the 2012 edition of the 1001 films you need to see before you die. I've actually read this whole thing. I recommend actually buying the book itself instead of just looking up the list on Letterboxd because the reason you want the book is for the essays inside it and not just because it's a list of films. The book is sectioned off by decade which is incredibly helpful and it even has like its own checklist at the beginning so you can mark off what you've seen. In the entire book, the only essay I found that I disagreed with was the one on Disney's Fantasia, where the person writing the essay seemed to have contempt for the fact that this Disney film wasn't like Bambi or Dumbo and was instead a more artistic movie aimed at achieving a, I don't know, level of culture. And the essay writer complains the only good part of the movie is the ballet of animals, I think it's called, which is arguably the safest and most traditional part of the movie. It's basically a merry Melody but with a higher budget. Was Mary Melody was Disney, right? I get confused between Mary Melody and Silly Symphony. But apart from this person who was so far off the mark they probably based their animated Oscar vote on what their kids liked, every other entry in the book is fascinating. With true reverence and respect for the films it talks about, even if the film itself isn't like a high art film and is just a movie that's entertaining. The essay will still make you care about the movie in a, like, intimate manner, if that makes sense. On the opposite end of the scale is the For One Week Only book, which is about the exploitation and grindhouse movie industry, which really deserves a lot more coverage in books about film than it actually gets. Even if you don't like exploitation films, I would still recommend it to you if you have any interest in movies and the movie industry, especially its history, because it gives a lot of insight into what film is as a whole and where it came from, because even though exploitation films were a completely different industry from the Hollywood industry, they both affected and reflected each other in important ways. I also tentatively want to recommend Hollywood Babylon by Kenneth Anger, which is one of the rare books I think I've read two or three times. It was originally published in the early 70s and was at the time the first book to really peel back the Hollywood curtain and detail all the crime and drugs and murder and scandal that Hollywood was trying its best to sweep under the rug and hope people would forget about. 
However, I say I want to recommend it tentatively because a good bit of this book is embellished and not all the facts are completely accurate. Luckily, there's a podcast out there discussing Anger's rather fluid interpretation of Hollywood history, so you can properly fact check and reference for yourself several of the cases presented on the book. I have heard the book referred to as fake news, although I think that might be going a little too far. On the whole, however, it is a very good introduction to historic Golden Age Hollywood crime and scandal. Just don't take it as gospel. If there's a case you find in the book and you think it's interesting, read up on it further rather than just reading Kenneth Anger's presentation of the case and taking that as the accurate interpretation of events. I recommend this version of the novel, which was republished in 1981 because some of the earlier publications of the book includes crime scene photos of the Black Dahlia. And although this version also has several crime scene photos in it, it doesn't have the Black Dahlia photos. And trust me, you don't need to see the Black Dahlia crime scene. No, I mean it. Do not Google it. You can Google the Black Dahlia and read up on the unsolved murder, but don't go out of your way to find the actual crime scene photos. Listen to me and trust me, this isn't reverse psychology. This is not a dare. Don't do it. You'll only upset yourself and won't learn anything more than what a description could give you. It's, it's not worth it. We have a final shelf on this bookcase, but it's actually reserved for personal books gifted to me by relatives and books I've inherited from grandparents. So I'm going to skip it because th those aren't really stories for like a YouTube channel, <laughs> or at least not mine. And so we go to the final bookcase. The very top shelf of this last one is a bit of a catch-all, but in general it's where I keep the books on mythology and folklore, and the one or two books there don't fit anywhere else. This book on mudlarking I got for my birthday this year, and it's very good so far. Mudlarking is a hobby I think I could easily pick up if I was lucky enough to live in the UK. And then this one is also from my birthday this year and is from Alan Watts, who I've mentioned once or twice before just in passing. He's a philosopher focusing on Zen and translating Eastern philosophy for a Western audience. I find his way of thinking incredibly valuable. He's ironically become very popular in the past few years, despite having passed away in 1973. I think a big part of it has to do with the fact that he had the incredible foresight to make endless audio recordings of all his lectures, providing us with like literal hours upon hours of his philosophy in his own words. But we have been brought up not to feel that we belong in the world. So our popular speech reflects it. We say, I came into this world. You didn't, you came out of it. The Art of Zen is his big bestseller book, but I think for obvious reasons, I decided to buy this as my starter book instead. I also have this photography book on Fukushima, which was evacuated in 2011 because of the nuclear meltdown they had. I mentioned it briefly in the Maroka um, video I made a while back. I have a big soft spot for abandoned photography, so I really like this one. I have another book by the same author and photographer on abandoned Soviet buildings, but my brother is busy borrowing it at the moment. Then there's also this book on roikans, which are traditional Japanese hot springs and hotels, which is very good and talks a lot about Japanese traditionalist design in art and architecture. The weird ass shape book here is a collection of space photos from the Hubble, just to ease some curiosity if you wonder what that is. And then we have a shelf that's probably not shocking to anyone who's seen any of my videos, the history shelf. Oh, also Howard Carter can sit over here, thank you. First we have a book purely based on historical treasures, like both hordes that have been found, as well as hordes that have been lost, and some hordes where we're not entirely sure if they ever really existed, but they are documented in historical and contemporary texts. I like the concept of the book overall, and it's really good. 
but then it titled my favorite archaeology story with 50 shades of gray for some godforsaken reason and it just puts a bad taste in my mouth for the whole thing and i don't even know why because it is a really good book and it's got a really good sense of humor maybe it's just because it's my favorite story that it just gets under my skin and it's really unfair though because the book is very good uh, maybe it's good i bought it before i saw the title of this chapter because i may have just put it back on the shelf and not bought it and i think i would have missed out I also have this book on Stonehenge, which we actually bought when I was 10 and my family was visiting Stonehenge. And my parents made me promise that if they bought me this book, I would actually read it. I haven't read it yet. We then have my absolute favorite book on archaeology that I've read, and which I had the misfortune of buying first. So I'm always looking for books that can hold up to it. It's a book on archaeological finds, but not only giving history on the archaeology and artifacts themselves, but also the history of the find, like the archaeologists who did the discovery of the items. This is where I first read the story of the Suton Hu find, which I'm obsessed with the story behind that discovery, as well as the story of John Louis Bacart, I think it is. He kept changing his name, so it's like Jean Louis Bocart or John Ludwig Bocart, and he has an Arabic name as well. And he was one of the most badass people I've ever read about in my entire life. The man discovered Petra by accident. <laughs> it also gives praise to the very earliest archaeologists, the people of the late 1700s and early 1800s. The ones were studying and researching the science of the past and dared to suggest that the earth and human beings were more than 10,000 years old. Unlike what the church had been insisting upon for centuries. And the very, very slow growth of this interest in the far off past. There's a very popular public consensus lately that the British Museum is bad and evil because it stole everything inside it. Something which is not even true, again I point you towards the story of the Suton Hu find, but also because even if we all agree that the museum does house stolen artifacts, whose ownership and importance to their countries of origin should be reevaluated, to boil every historical archaeologist down to an Indiana Jones stereotype who did nothing but swoop into foreign countries to loot their tombs for gold is incredibly black and white thinking with absolutely no nuance to reality in it and is in fact extremely insulting to the foundations of the subject of history and archaeology. Look, I'm not defending colonialism, I am just begging people to understand that there is a nuance here, like with everything, and to disregard the people who created this field of study, which is at its core about honoring and connecting with humanity's past, as this black and white matter of grave robbers stealing from other cultures just to get rich, is incredibly ignorant. There are precious few at ease with moral ambiguities, so we act as though they don't exist. Sorry, I have no idea why I need to torrent about that, it's just something that drives me crazy. On to a lighter topic, this book of Victorian newspaper headlines is called Horrible Murder. This book is fantastic. It's literally just a collection of newspaper headlines and articles from the mid to late 1800s. And if you thought fake news was a recent problem, then you're in for a rude awakening. I haven't read this book cover to cover yet, but just paging through it is weirdly hilarious. Even when some of the reports do cover horrible events like suicides or murder, just the fake news screaming sensationalist way these stories are written is so over the top it's so hard to take any of it seriously. A bit like literally any social media, to be honest. I also have these really large books I don't want to pull off the shelves right now because putting them back is a pain. This one is about paleontology in Antarctica because it wasn't always frozen over. A book on Arctic explorer Shackleton, who you might be aware of. Gregorian and Victorian Britain. A book on the 1930s, which was really valuable in my 30s cartoon video. And then this beast, which is just like a visual encyclopedia of different artifacts through history from across the world up until modern times. 
My friend gave me this book, which is actually a book published by a magazine Vinnie Vinesource once talked about called Strange New Jersey. The magazine did so well, they ended up publishing an entire book. And when that did so well, they made this book, which is the same thing, but about England. It's far more interested in just talking about weird things than going into the historical details of a thing. So I wouldn't call it a book of facts or anything like that, but it's great for just a really enthusiastic collection of photos and stories of these guys basically going, check out this weird thing we found. It's great. Please go support them. They're really cool. On the other side, I have some more books on archaeology and artifacts. I still need to read the book on the mummies of Urumish, I think it's pronounced. The Bog Bodies book I really want to recommend though. I love this book. It's divided up into sections, so the first part of the book is just explaining the history of the um, regions as a whole, or as much as we know at least, as well as what little we can learn from each individual person that was discovered. And then the other sections cover the discovery and study of each individual person. It's really easy to read, so you don't need to be into genetics and understand chemicals and like the entire science of it, which is important to me because I am the absolute worst at science. <laughs> and then I want to talk about one of the weirdest books I own, which I love to death, which is Animal Fakes and Frauds. This book is entirely about fake taxidermy or at least fake animals that have been presented as scientifically accurate. It is amazing. I almost lost my shit when I played near Automata and one of the fish you have to catch is the fur-bearing trout because guess what's in this book? It covers everything from fake butterfly findings by people who really wanted to get scientific recognition to those awful Fiji mermaid things to those totally real stories by self-proclaimed explorers of weird animals they saw in other countries to whatever the hell this thing is. I bought this cheap at a farmer's market and it's one of my favorite books I own. It's not even a subject I'm particularly interested in. It's just such a weird, weird book. And if you can find it, because I think it's out of print, please get a copy. It's, it's really good. Under it, I have a book published in the 80s on great historical mysteries. Now, despite how it sounds, I'm not actually really that knowledgeable on history like this. I just know about the stuff I read and watch, but it's not like I have any official education on the subject outside of high school. So I might be wrong, but I was happy when I paged through this book to find only one entry in it was a mystery I knew for a fact we'd solved since this book's publication, which was the entry about Anastasia and Alexei Romanov whose remains had not been discovered at the time of publication and people were still unsure if the two children could have escaped the massacre or if they had died with the rest of the family. We've since discovered the two children's remains and they have been positively identified by DNA as Alexei and either Anastasia or her um, slightly older sister. But other than that, almost every other mystery in this book, to my knowledge, is still a huge question mark. Which in this case is pretty cool, because the problem with history books in general, especially archaeology more than anything else, is you have to look at when the book was published. Because if the book was published too far back, there's a good chance that the information in the book is outdated and you might be reading and learning information which isn't really true even though it was thought of to be true at the time. So to have a book titled Unsolved Mysteries in History and have most of them still be unsolved is really interesting. However, I think if I were to do cross research I would find that there's a lot more information regarding some of these entries than there was at the time of publication or some things might have changed and they might have switched up their thinking about it. It's almost like a lost media iceberg, but for weird history shit. Actually, maybe I should make that iceberg. I then have two books on the ocean, one from the 70s and one from 2009, and a second copy of an animal encyclopedia, which I grew up with since my original downstairs is falling apart. And then we come to the very last shelf. This one is only a rough theme, mostly housing my Terry Pratchett paperbacks, and my Moomin books and DVDs. 
I actually have a biography on Tove Janssen as well, but I think I still need to unpack it from storage, and which is bothering me. I also have the Hyperbole and a Half book, which is very good, and that fake paranormal YA romance novel by Lindsay Ellis that's basically her attempt to try and write a horrible Twilight style novel about a young girl falling in love with Cthulhu. It's purposefully written to be terrible and is actually really really funny if you're in on the joke. Then there's the novel by Chris Sanders Wife, which I still need to read. And lastly, a book of Khalil Gibran's poetry, which my mom bought for my birthday one year. Khalil Gibran is the author of the book The Prophet, which is a collection of poetry, not a religious text. I've seen some people see the book, see the title The Prophet, and automatically think it's like a weird cult book for some reason. It's similar to Alan Watts' philosophies on life, except whereas Watts focused mainly on the metaphysical aspect of being, the prophet instead tries to express in words the nature of physical existence and human experience. I will caress your tenderest branches and shake every clinging root. And that's it. Those are my bookshelves. Believe it or not, these are not all the books I own. I have some books in the family bookshelves, like Dinotopia and a book on children's book illustrations from the golden age of children's books illustrations. But for the most part, these are my bookshelves. Thank you so very much to all my subscribers, both past and hopefully future, for checking out my stuff. I hope I can keep making videos about things you're actually interested in and that you find enjoyable or maybe if I'm lucky enough may even useful. For now though I've had my break talking about things that I actually enjoy and now it's time to get back to part four of High Guardian Spice. <laughs> Thanks for hanging out everyone. <laughs>